Hi, this is Jeffrey Reddick, creator of Final Destination. Greetings, Slashaholics. This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror books, the Bard's Blood Horror Shakespeare books. Hey guys, this is Jason Brooks, Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th Vengeance. Hey, this is Slasher Pepper. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th Part 6. This is William Patterson, known to Friday the 13th fans as Eric Morris. Hi, this is Deborah Voorhees from Friday the 13th Part 5. Hey folks, this is Adam Marcus, director of Jason Goes to Hell and Secret Santa. <laughs> Hello, kitties. This is John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper. Hi, this is Kane Hodder. Better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. And you're listening. You're listening. And you're listening. And you're listening. I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening. You are listening. And you are listening. And you are lucky enough to be listening. Okay, boils and ghouls. You are listening. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. The 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To 80s Slasher Librarian. To 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. So you decided to stop and let Chuck know it's just you. Here's what happened. Don't worry, Chuck, it's just me, you yell. You wave the lantern so he can see you. I couldn't sleep, came out here to get some air. Right, Chuck replies. Just checking. He turns and goes off in the other direction as you breathe a sigh of relief. That was close. You look at your watch. It's almost ten o'clock. The train is approaching through the north orchard, and the dog is on the track. Your timing is perfect. You reach for the rawhide in your pocket, and just as the dog leaps, you toss it into the air. He catches the rawhide in his teeth. You grab the scruff of his neck and loop the rope over his head as the whistle blows for the third time. You can see the brakesman lantern swinging as the train slows almost to a stop. You pick up the dog and heave him at Saul as he leans out the door of the passenger coach. Jeremiah salutes you with his lantern as the caboose passes by. The steam engine puffs along through the orchard below the house and then disappears. As you walk back up to the house, you're left with an empty feeling. You'd like to know what happens to the crew. You climb the stairs to your room and put the lantern down on the hearth. You wonder if it still has the power to signal to the train in the other time zone, or if it only worked when the train was between time lines. You take off your damp clothes and crawl under the warm comforter. You fall asleep instantly. The next morning, Harry hollers to you before your alarm goes off. At first, you think you're dreaming, but when Mrs. Winters taps on the bedroom door, you know it's no dream. You hop out of bed and hurry to open the door. Hurry down, she says. Harry needs you. You throw on your clothes and run downstairs, wondering what the fuss is all about. Harry is in the office eating breakfast. He pushes a plate of bacon and eggs towards you. Here, eat up, he says. Sorry about the rush, but we're short-staffed today. I, I need you to go work in the fruit stand. But Belinda, you start to say. Belinda's disappeared, Harry says. When she didn't come to pick up the cash box at 6.30, I sent Miss Winters over with it. Belinda's gone, lock, stock, and barrel. The picker's cabin is so clean it looks like she never lived there to begin with. Of course, Belinda's gone back to the other time zone with the dog, you think. A big grin crosses your face as you put the pieces together. That means it really did happen, and the train men are now back with their families. What are you grinning at? Harry asks you. Oh, I'm just looking forward to working in the fruit stand, you tell him. It'll be different. Well, here's the cash box, Harry says. Chuck's waiting outside. Chuck? Yeah, he's going to give you a ride to the fruit stand. You pick up the cash box and go out. The pickup truck is loaded with boxes of cherries and apricots and early peaches for the stand. Hurry up, Chuck says. At least that Indian woman got there on time. Didn't ride, always walk, good four miles from the house. 
but she was prompt. I'll give her that. I'm usually prompt, too, you say. I didn't even know I was going to be working in the fruit stand until ten minutes ago. You were out late last night, Chuck says, snooping around with that lantern. If you're spying on me, you'll be sorry. You start to speak, but he cuts you off. That's what that Indian woman did. Followed me around. Never said anything, just watched. Good riddance to her. A truck passes you, and the driver flashes his headlights. Hey, I think that driver signaled to you, you say to Chuck. Never saw him before, Chuck says. Your intuition tells you he's lying. Two miles down the road, you know you're right when you see the same truck parked on the shoulder. The driver is standing beside the vehicle, waving as you approach. Chuck ignores the man and drives quickly past, but not before you've seen the red and black Naldo emblem on the truck. Why would a Naldo driver signal Chuck, you wonder? You walking back, or do you expect me to come and get you when you're done? Chuck asks you. Walking back sounds a lot more pleasant than riding with Chuck again. On the other hand, if you ask for a ride, you might be able to learn why the Naldo driver was flagging him. Okay, it's time to make a choice. When your workday is finished, do you want to walk home by yourself? Or would you like Chuck to come pick you up? So you might be able to get a little more information and find out why the Naldo driver was waving at him. The choice is yours. The path awaits.